Hello again, fellow Mystery Files. Today I begin a two-part discussion on S.S. Van Dyne's 20 Rules for Writing Detective Stories that first appeared in the 1928 article Van Dyne wrote for the American Magazine. This actually appeared one year before the probably more famous Ronald Knox's Ten Commandments of Mystery Writing, which pretty much overlaps, so I decided to focus on Van Dyne's article for this video. S.S. Van Dyne is best known for writing the Philo Van series, beginning with the Benson murder case. Van Dyne was a critic before becoming a mystery writer, although he did write some mystery short fiction under a number of different aliases. Ronald Knox was a Catholic priest who also wrote detective fiction, hence his Ten Commandments, which are better known, but I believe that, again and again, they overlap considerably with Van Dyne's Twenty, but I will still talk about Knox here and there. I will not spoil any book solutions in this video, so no need for a spoiler warning. And before I begin, make sure you subscribe to the channel and like this video. Rule number one, according to Van Dyne, is, quote, the reader must have equal opportunity with the detective for solving the mystery. All clues must be plainly stated and described, unquote. Knox does not have a direct parallel to this one, but several of his commandments allude to this. And this is rule number one because it is the most important rule. If you've followed my channel for a while now, you'll know I have no problems knocking a book several spots lower because it doesn't play fair. This is the fair play commandment. In my last video, I knocked second shot for doing this. And the reason why this is so important is twofold. One is not to mislead the reader. Readers love to try to solve the murder alongside the detective, but he or she will feel cheated if all the information was not provided, or even worse, if the reader was directly lied to. It makes the ending unsatisfying. And the other issue is that I think not playing fair is indicative of bad writing skills. Any good author should be able to set up their murder without withholding information. If you cannot do that with your mystery, then either you have a bad mystery or you're not skilled enough to find a way around it. It's that simple for me. And I, in second rule, is very similar to the first, and that is, quote, No willful tricks or deceptions may be placed on the reader other than those played legitimately by the criminal on the detective himself, unquote. And this is very close to the fair play rule. I do think this one is misunderstood a lot. We have so many detective novels where the detective is being deceived alongside the reader. And I sometimes see complaints about this, but this does play fair. If the detective doesn't know something, then it is not misleading. Agatha Christie is infamous for this, while she will point her readers in the wrong direction alongside Poirot or Miss Marple or whoever. This is absolutely fair and is indicative of good writing. It ups the difficulty level of the mystery. Rule number three is a frequently broken rule, and that is, quote, there must be no love interest. The business in hand is to bring a criminal to justice, not to bring a lovelorn couple to the hymeneal altar, unquote. And this one is probably the rule that is broken the most often, and if I'm being honest, is a rule I simply don't care about. Now, I am pretty critical of mystery novels that focus too heavily on the romantic elements, such as The Hollow, or pretty much any Miss Silver mystery, but I wouldn't be as strict as to forbid it. And I understand that Van Dyne, what he's going for here, detective fiction was created in a similar vein as Bram Stoker's Dracula to restore the social order. A crime is committed, the perfect society is ruined, and must be fixed via the detective. Detectives only exist to fix the social order. You'll notice that early literary detectives have no love life whatsoever, except for maybe a brief flirt, if even that, like one time. The likes of Sherlock Holmes, Hercule Poirot, Miss Marple, Roger Sheringham are all single, never married, and never have a true love story. Even like Lord Peter Whimsey and Roderick Allen start off as single and basically asexual, though they later have a love interest. And when they did, it was considered quite shocking for the time. But Van Dyne also excludes the non-detective characters from romance, and this is where I strongly disagree. The personal lives of these characters are often extremely crucial to some of the best detective novels, the likes of Death on the Nile, 
Calamity Town are all reliant on the romantic element. Again, I agree that overly romantic subplots can get annoying and distracting, but Van Dyne makes no exceptions. And we do see this with the early Golden Era mysteries where the motive is typically money as opposed to love or hate. Even something like The Mysterious Affair at Styles, which does have a love story in there, the main motive is money. The romance is merely tangential. And in the present day, I mean, this rule has simply been abandoned for the most part. I mean, you're going to find love story in pretty much every mystery novel written in the nowadays. But, you know, I think this one really has been abandoned and probably for the better. Number four states, quote, the detective himself or one of the official investigators should never turn out to be the culprit. This is bald trickery on a par with offering someone a bright penny for a $5 gold piece its false pretenses, unquote. And I'm not going to spoil any specific novel with this one, but this rule is broken a lot, and I think mostly for the better. I disagree with the assertion that having a detective murderer is unfair, so as long as the narration does not lie to the reader and all the clues are present to get the reader to that conclusion. I understand that perhaps in the dawn of the detective novel, and we can disagree on when exactly that was, that such a concept might be too much for a reader, but I personally have no problems with this. Now, I think in the present day, an investigator, whether a professional, amateur, assistant, or what have you, an investigator, murderer, borders on cliche. This was used very sparingly and very deliberately in the golden age, and it was always to very shocking and exciting results. But now, I think it's overused and lacks the punch it used to have. I would recommend current day writers not go there, not because of this rule, but just because it's been done to death already. Rule number five, quote, The culprit must be determined by logical deductions, not by accident or coincidence or unmotivated confession. To solve a criminal problem in this latter fashion is like sending the reader on a deliberate wild goose chase, and then telling him, after he has failed, that you have the object of his search up your sleeve all the time. Such an author is no better than a practical joker." Unquote. And that's a lot of words to say the detective must actually detect. No coincidences or accidents allowed. I'm a firm believer in this one. While I'm willing to accept coincidences in the setup of a murder mystery, and to some extent throughout because you don't want the reader to sacrifice a good story for the sake of credibility and dulling the shocking reveal. I think this is another rule that gets misunderstood. Van Dyne explicitly states the culprit must be determined using logic, so any accident or coincidence that pops up requires another step. And specifically, I think of Lord Edgware Dies, where Poirot, by chance, overhears a cryptic line, and it is that what gets him to the solution. It is a coincidence, but there's an extra step required for Poirot to solve the case. He has to sit there and think about it. It's not just handed to him. And, you know, the Miss Silver novel, The Vanishing Point, ends with Miss Silver essentially just listening in on conspirators reveal their plot by pure chance, which is something I would put in this category. This is a pretty solid rule that should be followed, and typically still is, except in only the poorest written mysteries. Rule number six states, quote, The detective novel must have a detective in it, and a detective is not a detective unless he detects. His function is to gather clues that will eventually lead to the person who did the dirty work in the first chapter, and if the detective does not reach his conclusions through an analysis of those clues, he has no more solved this problem than the schoolboy who gets his answers out of the back of the arithmetic." Unquote. This one is pretty straightforward and almost a repeat of the previous rule. A detective, of course, being an, any investigator, needs to detect. I don't think Van Dyne means a professional detective, an amateur will suffice. I think the only interesting part of this rule worthy of discussion is the bit about the dirty work in the first chapter. It's almost thrown in there, and this part I strongly disagree with. It was a common belief in like the 1920s that a detective story had to begin with the murder. Christie refuted this wonderfully in Toward Zero, where she made the point that the murder is sort of the end of the story, and everything that leads up to the murder is the more interesting dynamic. And every mystery author has probably multiple books in which this murder happens beyond the first chapter, and I approve of such. There needs to be a setup to the story. By having the murder in the first chapter, to me, indicates the writer isn't too interested in anything else like the characters, like the atmosphere, and I think that's a real shame. Rule number seven states, quote, There simply must be a corpse in a detective novel, and the deader the corpse, the better. 
No less crime than murder will suffice. 300 pages is far too much pother for a crime other than murder. After all, the reader's trouble and expenditure of energy must be rewarded. Unquote. I support this rule like 9 out of 10 times. If your mystery novel does not have a body in it, it's likely to be a flop. I mean, I've missed Silver Novel, Lonesome Row, which I maintain is the worst mystery novel from the Golden Age, does not have a murder and sorely needs one. And this is a rule that remains followed today. We don't see a lot of mystery novels that don't have a murder nowadays. I would exclude mysteries geared toward children and teens for this, as they often focus more on robberies, etc., than murders, and for logical reasons. Now, there are absolutely exceptions to this. Gaudy Night, which is Lord Peter Whimsey novel by Dorothy Sayers, absolutely fills the bill for a fantastic mystery novel that does not have a murder. And then you can get into debates about, like, is Mr. Priestley's Problem by Anthony Barclay, which doesn't have a real body, is that a mystery novel? You know, you can debate over that. But I think Gaudy Knight is an exception to the rule, not the norm. More often than not, if your mystery novel does not have a body, it is not interesting and is not strong enough to sustain a full-length novel. The norm is a mystery novel without a body is likely to flop. Rule number eight, quote, the problem of the crime must be solved by strictly naturalistic means. Such methods for learning the truth as slate writing, Ouija boards, mind reading, spiritualistic seances, crystal gazing, and the like are taboo. A reader has a chance of matching his wits with a rationalistic detective, but if he must compete with the world of spirits and go chasing about the fourth dimension of metaphysics, he is defeated ab initio, meaning from the beginning, unquote. This rule is a must follow and one i can't think of an instance where a major writer used the supernatural in their resolutions there are writers who use the supernatural in interesting ways agatha christie always used people's belief in the supernatural against them and in the likes of the sitterford mystery for example one of my favorite passages in a lord peter whimsy novel is miss clemson's fake seance and strong poison though again that's not a real seance but the seance is used to get to the solution in an interesting and logical way. And this rule has been held today. Now, I know there are some like cozy mystery series themed around witches and spirit mediums. I haven't read them because I don't really read cozy mysteries, but I assume there's a logical explanation in those books. The only mystery-like series I can even think of that breaks this rule is the Ace Attorney video game series, which features a lot of spirit mediums, but that's a video game series, and I would not hold that to the same standard as I would a mystery novel. Rule number nine, quote, there must be but one detective, that is, but one protagonist of deduction, one deus ex machina, to bring the minds of three or four, or sometimes a gang of detectives, to bear on a problem is not only to disperse the interest and break the direct thread of logic, but to take an unfair advantage to the reader. If there is more than one detective, the reader doesn't know who is his co-deductor is. It's like making the reader run a race without a relay team." Unquote. This rule is followed more often than it appears. I'm not the strictest adherer to this particular rule. It is true that many, many books have more than one detective, but there is typically only one lead detective. If you have multiple detectives of equal influence, the story does tend to bounce around quite a bit and become unfocused when the author has to dedicate equal page space to all of them. There are a number of detecting duos and groups like the Hardy Boys or like Tommy and Tuppence, but if you notice, even in those books, the duo does the Scooby Gang thing and splits up. So during the sequences where major investigations are happening, the reader is only with one of the duo, either Tommy or Tuppence, either Frank or Joe, and rarely with both. I agree things can get a little crowded with too many investigators, like we see in The Body in the Library, but this isn't a rule I'm super strict on. The final rule I will discuss in this video is rule number 10, quote, the culprit must turn out to be a person who has played a more or less prominent part in the story, that is, a person with whom the reader is familiar and in whom he takes an interest, unquote. This is an important one to me. I've railed against several books where the murderer comes in very late into the book or is a character who is barely in the book. It happens all the time. All the big authors have done it at least once. 
I don't want to spoil any books in this video, but the most egregious example of this is Posture and a Fate, the final Tommy and Tuppence, where the killer only shows up in like the final 20 pages or so. I know I feel cheated and dismayed when I discover the killer is someone I barely know, or even a character I forgot existed if they're introduced early enough. It makes the book seem like a waste of time. Knox states in his Ten Commandments that the murderer needs to be at least mentioned in the early part of the novel, which I also agree with. In fact, all the major characters in a mystery novel need to be introduced, I would say no later than 20% into the story. I can't stand it when someone who is supposed to be a viable suspect or like an extremely important character just shows up past the halfway point for the first time and we're supposed to care about them because quite frankly, I just don't at that point. It just doesn't work and it's poor storytelling. And that's it for this video. Next week, I finished my discussion with the second half of these 20 rules, so stay tuned for that. And make sure you like and subscribe to the channel. Until next time, Mystery Files.